for me, well, the first thing I want to say is uh, congratulations. Uh, because by being graduates or soon to be graduates in psychology, you've clearly mo made the wisest, most sensible, and most career enhancing choice that you could have made uh, for your degrees. Uh, and I mean that almost completely seriously. Um, I think it probably is one of the best degrees in the world, and there, there are factual reasons for that. Um, because human beings are intensely variable, because there are a plethora of factors that impact on our beh behavior, one of the things that we have to do as psychologists is apply a scientific discipline to understanding why things happen. Um, the idea of saying, of answering the question, why did she do that with, well, I just happen to think, is not acceptable. Now, it may well be the case that Nigel Farage and Donald Trump live in a post-fact world, uh, but I don't and you don't. And the idea of applying a bit of scientific discipline, a bit of logic, a bit of uh, fact-checking, a bit of evidence base to the things that we do um, should stop us all dying, to be perfectly honest. So I think the, uh, the application of science to the real world is valuable. Leading on from that becomes numeracy. So a psychology degree gives you numeracy. It's very difficult to study human behavior and to measure things that need to be measured in terms of psychological factors without a degree of uh, mathematics, even statistics. And that makes us hugely uh, attractive employees. We have to put these things together into a logical sequence. We have to muster our arguments. We have to consider the uh, points that we're making. We have to, indeed, when we're writing essays, we have to consider the arguments on the other side, and you know, often our essay titles are A, B, contrast, and we have to work our way through the logical sequence of, of argument. And this makes us literate, it makes us uh, logical, it makes us perfect for uh, working in civic society. And then finally, uh, a psychology degree uh, is relevant. It's with apologies to dentists and the engineers who design chairs and the people who build bridges. Um, those are wonderful things. I'm very glad that there are engineers and chair designers and, and bridge builders in the world. But it's not about human beings. And I think our degree is one that makes us interested and interesting. Uh, the world is a world where uh, relevance matters, at least to me. Uh, this is, as I've said, uh, before, a photograph of me. I won't give any prizes to the people who can spot me. Um, just as an offshoot, in that photo, which is from 1987, is me, and I'm now president of the British Psychological Society. There's a woman called Esther cohen Tovey, who is now the chair of the Division of Clinical Psychology. And there's a guy called David Halpern, who now runs the Behavioural Insights team for the Cabinet Office uh, in Downing Street. And we were all in the same class at university, and none of us knew each other, and we haven't spoken to each other since. And uh, me and Esther didn't know that we were in the same class until about three weeks ago. And I have various meetings with David Halpern, and he didn't know, because obviously we're all a bit sad and lonely at the time. But, and here's my point, uh, one of the things about that, and I will give it away, uh, one of the things about that photo is that from 30 years ago, I was there proudly wearing my Greenpeace sweatshirt. And the idea of having some sort of a focus on uh, the relevance of the stuff that we were doing and uh, social justice, I think, it, it was important to me then. I, I think, I can't swear, um, some of my colleagues who work in the interesting areas of the civil service might be able to tell me if they look in the records, but I believe I'm the only member of, uh, I'm the only president of the British Psychological Society to have been arrested and interrogated by MI5 um, because I was doing, at the time, uh, things that Margaret Thatcher thought were inappropriate, and I'm very proud of that fact too. Um, in 1967, uh, Martin Luther King addressed the American Psychological Association and suggested that uh, behavioral scientists, psychologists, had a role then, you know, this 50 years ago, in the uh, civil rights movement. And I believe that his words are as true now as they were then. His quote includes uh, that there are things in our society that we must be maladjusted to. We need to change things. This is, of course, coming from a human rights, civil rights activist. And that we should not adjust ourselves to the uh, political sphere if the political sphere is wrong. It's a little bit like people in the military not obeying unlawful orders. And there comes a time when one must take a stand that is neither safe nor politic nor popular 
but one must take it because it's right. Uh, and I think, again, channeling my inner Lisa, I think there's something about the role of psychologists, of academic and professional psychologists, in speaking out about those things about which we believe uh, there should be change. So for me, personally, I, I, uh, one of the opportunities that is extended to me by taking these sorts of speeches at conferences is to press manifestos. Since we're talking about an MP, we can talk about political manifestos. And for me, as a psychologist, I want to see a change. I want to see a radical change in the way that we approach uh, mental health in this country and, and indeed worldwide. I think for me, rather than seeing uh, human distress as forms of pathology, forms of disease, uh, othering the, the process, describing them rather than us, uh, seeing these things as disorders and uh, dysfunctional aspects of human behavior, I'd like to see them as fundamentally social and psychological aspects of human life. And so for me, I think we have uh, a need, and I guess I would say a duty, to change the way in which we approach these things. It's a scientific approach. So for me, I think that we need to understand not how people are rendered ill, but instead we need to understand how psychological factors, how biological factors, how social factors, and how circumstances impact upon us as human beings. So instead of seeing it as uh, what is the etiology of this person's disorder, we need to see it as what factors have impacted on this person's understanding of the world in order to render them distressed and anxious and uh, confused and out of touch with reality. And I render it as a, a complex interactive dance between nature and nurture. I personally believe that psychology as a discipline gives us something that lifts at least human beings beyond nature and nurture. My logic is somewhat like this, which is uh, the way that I see the world is profoundly important in determining my behavior, my attitudes, my relationships with other people, and in the case of mental health, uh, my emotions and my behaviors in that respect. If I believe that the world is a worthless place and my contribution to it is zero, then I will feel as if there is no purpose in life and I will feel like killing myself, if I believe that. Now, there are reasons why I might believe that, and there are reasons why it so happens that I don't believe that. And this is me, as an individual, making sense of the world and coming to conclusions about the world. There are reasons, in terms of both nature and nurture, why I would come to those decisions, but it's me as a psychological agent who is making those uh, conclusions. So for me, nature and nurture don't answer the question of why I'm depressed. Nature and nurture are the influences on me as I work out how to think about the world and myself and my relationships with other people and the future. And I think psychology is key to understanding that relationship between nature and nurture uh, when it comes to human behavior. If you take this kind of logic, at least for me, uh, psychologists have things to say that are controversial, difficult, uh, but also, I have to say, successful. So when the American Psychiatric Association, back in 2013, decided that the sales uh, and the profit, therefore, of their Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Edition 4 were dropping off, they wanted to uh, reboot the brand a little bit, and they were working on what was called DSM-5, a new way of categorizing the so-called illnesses that people fall into. And me and colleagues in the UK and the British Psychological Society, I'm pleased to say, but also members of the American Psychological Association, uh, were campaigning about the idiocy of this approach. Um, for what it's worth, I think that if veterans come back from mechanized warfare distressed and traumatized by what they've seen, I think that post-traumatic stress, if you really are insistent upon using Latin and Greek terms to describe human experiences, then I guess you can believe in the concept of post-traumatic stress. I don't think it's a disorder. I don't think there's anything disordered about seeing armed conflict and coming back distressed. Standing here now, I feel anxiety. I feel anxiety about performing and behaving in public. Social anxiety, I think, is a very real phenomenon. I think it's ludicrous to talk about social anxiety disorder. And I think it is obviously true that people, some of us more than others, some of us more distressing than others, some of us without any relief ever, some of us to the point of wishing to die, but most of us feel experience depression to different extents. 
Understanding why people get depressed, understanding why people stop being depressed, understanding why some of us manage to stay content, why some of us manage to survive resiliently the traumas of our lives, all of that is important. Uh, to talk about uh, disorders, I think, is, uh, is misleading. And, you know, as you can see from this, at least the editors of the British Medical Journal think that it is a, a reasonable contention. Uh, my colleague Mark Gabay, who's a GP in Liverpool, uh, came into my office one day and threw this at me, and so I ripped off the cover and it's now framed on my wall. But that's not the, uh, the high point of my career, because I spent a lot of time talking about the uh, unpsychological nature of the way that we approach psychiatric distress. And I got a phone call on a Sunday morning from a friend of mine, Ann Cook, who said, are you watching The Simpsons? And I said, of course I'm not watching The Simpsons, I'm a grown man, why would I watch The Simpsons? And she goes, well you should watch The Simpsons. So I, uh, I didn't as it happened, I couldn't be bothered. In episode 12 of series 25 of The Simpsons, in an episode called Diggs, Bart Simpson falls in love with Diggs. Diggs is played by Daniel Radcliffe, and all through the episode he has a kestrel on his arm. And most of you are too young to know what that means, but it's a reference to a very famous film in British history, uh, where a very odd boy is saved by the redemptive power of love and a kestrel, if I recall it correctly. Anyway, Bart falls in love with Diggs because Diggs is crazy, and they get expelled from school, and then Bart asks Diggs, are you clinically insane? And Diggs replies, the rumours of my bonkitude have been greatly exaggerated. DSM-5 indicates paranoid schizophrenia, but that work is mired in controversy, mired. And I have to say that when it comes to the real-world impact for REF of the uh, contribution that my work has made to British society, I can claim this still from The Simpsons as saying that my work has produced real-world effect. I have mired DSM-5 in controversy, and a damn good thing too. Why? Well, for a long time people have been talking about uh, anti-stigma campaigns, to talk about mental health by talking about the one in four. And the point there is to say mental health problems are really, really common, we should be solicitous and sympathetic towards people with mental health common, uh, problems because they're really common. You know, don't, don't think of these things as kind of weird, strange, exotic creatures lying out there. They're really common. One in four of us have mental health problems. But of course, it, it takes a matter of seconds to realise that what they're actually saying is three quarters of us are fine. And I don't think that's true. I don't think that one in four of us have mental health problems. I think all of us have emotions and relationships. All of us have tensions and ambitions and disappointments. Um, I was saying to Peter, I'm involved in a weird TV programme, and uh, I was saying to them that I had seven ambitions. Uh, back when I was a student, I had seven ambitions in my life. Uh, these were ambitions that would lead me not to feel miserable in old age, and I would then have regarded 51 as being old age. Uh, and I've achieved three out of the seven ambitions in my life, so I'm definitely going to go to my grave disappointed in myself and feeling that I've failed in my ambitions. We, we all have emotions, we all make sense of the world, uh, we, all, uh, uh, we, yeah. we all get upset from time to time, some of us more than others, but I think a continuum model embracing the idea that all of us have psychological issues and talking about the nature and extent of the distress that people feel, but not which one of us is the one who has the problem, is very important. I think this also relates to our own profession, our own discipline. So this is a, a quote uh, that obviously the editor of allaboutpsychology.com likes because he put it up there, so I thought I'd steal it back. Um, I'd remove the concept of abnormal psychology from our uh, textbooks and from our curricula. Many of you will have studied, hopefully some of you won't have studied, uh, a psychology degree that includes a module on abnormal psychology, uh, but I don't think it should. I don't think we should talk about abnormal psychology. I think we should talk about the psychology of emotions and the psychology of relationships, and we shouldn't talk about abnormal psychology. I don't think it's abnormal to feel that the world is a meaningless, dark, and unpleasant place. I think the world is a meaningless, dark, and unpleasant place, and I am surprised that we managed to get through the day without feeling like uh, ending it all. Um, but I don't think that's abnormal. I think that's the human condition. I think it's distressing and upsetting, but I think it's the human condition. We don't talk about abnormal physics. We don't talk about abnormal politics, although we probably should. It's just psychology. And that leads on to, I think we don't need to be sympathetic to those of us who have mental health problems. I think we need to be empathetic. I think we don't need to ask about why they might develop disorders. I think we need to ask about why we get depressed and anxious and confused. 
I think we need to put ourselves in other people's shoes and think about what affects our emotions rather than talk about their disorders. I'm a big fan of the Only Us campaign, which is run by a, an NHS chaplain called Mirror by Swingler, which again talks about breaking down the distinction between them and us. And I'm now realizing that I'm going on too long, but these things have important consequences. Uh, they have dramatic consequences for people caught up in the mental health system. This is the uh, outside exercise yard at a private NHS hospital that was recently shared on social media. Um, now, I'm sure that the people designing this hospital thought that they were attending to the safety needs of the people, the patients in their care. Um, the question is, well, the question is to look at Article 3 of the Human Rights Act, which states without any uh, equivocation that nobody should be subjected to torture or to inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. And the test of this is actually quite simple, which is, would an ordinary member of the public feel themselves to be degraded if they were treated in that way. So the question you have to ask yourself is, would you as ordinary members of the public feel degraded if that was the place in which you were expected to exercise when you were already admitted to hospital because you were feeling so desperate that people could not trust you to be left on your own? We need to change the situation. We need to change the way that we uh, help people with uh, uh, emotional distress. We need to change the way that we approach the psychology of mental health. So to go back to uh, uh, um, Martin Luther King, uh, there comes a time when one must take a stand that's neither safe nor politic nor popular, but one must take it because it's right. And I guess it's a shame that Lisa's not here because she knows all this and I think she agrees with it. Uh, but my point is that not only have you entered a uh, profession, a discipline, an academic uh, calling which is interesting and exciting and uh, entertaining, not only have you got or are going to get degrees that make you hugely valuable employees because you are numerate and literate and scientific and logical, but you're also entering into a profession where I think we have the potential to make uh, profound uh, changes for the better in our society. So on that point, I need to bugger off, I need to get a taxi, I need to run across town, and I know, need to go and meet the Health Professions Council to talk about the professional regulation of our profession. So I'm going to bugger off and leave you in other people's comfortable hands. Thank you.